Today on Art Scene will feature Denver Film Society and the 40th anniversary of the Denver Film Festival. An alternative to private studios for artists, Art Gym. Denver's newest music venue, Levitt Pavilion. And poet, Jose Guerrero. Everybody loves the movies, and Denver has a history of showcasing some of the best. Hey, I'm Bobby Lefebvre here at the C Film Center. The Denver Film Festival is celebrating its 40th anniversary. Quite a history. Let's take a look. We're joined by Ron Henderson, co-founder of the Denver Film Society and the Denver Film Festival. So 40 years. That's, 40 years. That's quite the, uh, the feat there. Uh, unbelievable, it's hard to believe. Uh, some days it seems like yesterday and other days it seems like 100 years. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yesterday. How was the Denver Film Society dreamt up and why was it started in the first place? There was a small group of us who were kind of interested in film and the arts and culture in Denver and we got together and met and was wondering kind of what was not available in the arts world and the cultural world in Denver and we decided a film festival so in May 1978 we launched uh, 10 Days in May. Uh, it was really an experiment. We didn't know whether the community or the media would respond to it but it was really uh, truly an overwhelming uh, success and we decided to do it another year. We all kept our day jobs, just in case. Sure. <laughs> and uh, for the first three years, it was basically a volunteer operation. And uh, here we are 40 years later. <clears throat> wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And 40 years, celebrating yeah. 40 years. Is that rare in the film festival industry to, to have something so long-standing? It's certainly monumental. We are one of the oldest um, and largest regional film festivals in the country. You know, we struggled in the early years because we basically, you know, we didn't have a home. But in 2000, uh, thanks to uh, a visionary named John J.C., who was the head of uh, Stars Entertainment, we were able to secure the Stars Film Center at the Tivoli mm -hmm. as our year-round home. And we were there for 11 years, and then we launched, launched a capital campaign, and we now own the C Film Center where we're standing today. It's such a great thing for a film society such as ours to have a permanent home so that we're not just coming out for 12 days in November and showcasing the best in world cinema. We get to do that every day of the year. And uh, we, we've uh, launched uh, education programs. Uh, we, we, we're here seven days a week, 365 days a year. This has really allowed us to expand our mission and um, open up the dialogue on a daily basis because we're not also just about showing films. We are about creating a community, um, a place for dialogue and conversation, and it's about bringing people out of their houses and kind of battling the, the Netflix phenomenon sure. and getting people to commune over the art of film. We do Film on the Rocks, mm -hmm. so that's our program that we've been doing for 18 years, and that's a kind of pop culture, mass audience, sure. kind of fun thing that we do, which is a band, a comedian, and a cult classic film. We do what we call mini festivals here at the C Film Center, so we have Cinema Q, which is our LGBTQ festival. We have Cine Latino, which is our Latino festival. We do a Women Plus Film Festival, which is dedicated to films by, for, and about women. Wow. Um, so we do those smattered throughout the year. And then additionally, we have a program called Filmmaker Focus, which is geared towards supporting our local filmmaking community with continuing education. What is it that you look for in a film that says, you know what, I really want people to see this here in, in Denver? It has to be a, a good film. It needs to be compelling, uh, have a good story, um, maybe a few surprises in it. Well, I always have 
um, our audience in mind. So we have a very diverse audience. Uh, we have about 45,000 people that attend the festival every year over the course of those 12 days. Wow. And so we like to listen to them. Um, we like to hear what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And then of course you're always just looking for great storytelling. The opening film of last year's festival was La La Land, That's and right. uh, Emma Stone and Damien Chazelle were here, mm -hmm. um, and they both went on to win Oscars for, for that film. We're a good luck film. charm. Right. So <laughs> what was that like, having them here sort of before all the hype and uh, to really experience that here in Denver? It was, it was really terrific. It was a magical night for sure. Um, when I saw La La Land at Telluride last year, I immediately walked out of the theater and was on the phone calling Lionsgate, mm -hmm. asking to program that film for the festival and particularly asking to program it at the Ellie Hawkins where we do opening night and for it to kick off the film festival. Because it's a movie about the celebration of movies sure. and um, a musical in, in, in the Ellie, I just knew it was going to be just, just magic. Yeah. Um, so the film itself is what was the driver in my decision to put it um, in that slot. Kevin Emma and Damien was just like the yeah, gravy. Yeah, that's right, huh? Film festivals are for the public to attend. It's not like what you see at Cannes. And sure. You have to put on a tuxedo <laughs> and you're, you're not invited to the party. Yeah. Everyone here in this community is invited to this party and this great celebration. Um, there's something for everyone, I promise, mm -hmm. in our festival lineup every single year. Our festival this year is November 1 to 11. Mm -hmm. We'll be here at the Sea Film Center. We'll be at the pavilions downtown and we'll have our red carpet events at the L.A. Calkins Opera House. Mm -hmm. So if you've never been to a festival, try it out. Yeah. And if you've never been to the Seed Film Center, come check it out. Uh, have a glass of wine at Henderson's Lounge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you like what you see, get a membership and you get discounts throughout the year. So uh, I'd, I'd really like to encourage anyone who hasn't been to the festival or hasn't visited our home to do so. Artists running their own space can get costly. Art Gym is a new alternative to private studio space. They recently held an open house with demonstrations and live performance. So here's an art moment with Art Gym.
To learn more about Art Gym, visit artgymdenver.com. We'll be back with much more art scene, including Denver's newest music venue, Levitt Pavilion, poet Jose Guerrero, and more from the Denver Film Festival. Hey, we're back on Art Scene. Now let's head to the studio with Michael Gadlin and poet Jose Guerrero. My first question to you is, I know poetry is an art. What got you started with this voice you have for, for this tool you have for art? What got you started? Uh, well, I, I used to go to a, a small school here in Denver and actually yeah. every second Friday of the month there was an open mic offered at our school. So oh, one of my teachers challenged me to go out there and, and give it a try and after I did that, I, I felt so empowered by, by being on the mic right. and, and being listened to and heard. And so I, I never stopped doing it ever since that day. Right. Were you always an outgoing young artist or young man who became this artist? I was outgoing, but I never thought about arts as an opportunity or as a career option. And right. so after that, it really did change my life. It transformed right. me. Right. Very cool. So what's the process of, of poetry and writing poetry or coming up with a piece? Well, for me, it's always uh, uh, relevant things that are happening in the world, yeah. um, social context is, is pretty important for me and so right. uh, usually I, something an event occurs or, or something goes down in the sure. world and, and that impacts me enough that I, I sit down and, and I, I walk around and talk to myself and eventually sure. come out with a, with a poem. That's cool. Now do you write your stuff down by hand or do you use a device? Because everyone's different nowadays, yeah. right? I mean, I don't see a lot of people handwriting anymore. So how, what's, what's that part of your process? Uh, well, I come from a hip hop background and right? so a lot of it uh, just happens in my brain. And so I sit around really? and a lot of times I look a little crazy walking around through the city talking yeah. to myself and, and reciting my poetry over and over again. And so for me, uh, it starts in the brain and then when I feel like the, the, the product is finished, then yeah. I go on and write it down. <laughs> now this is cool. So. Can you give us a piece right now? Yeah. I'm really excited. Right. Let's see that finished product, man. I got that special type of walk. The type of walk your daddy used when he first talked to your mama type of walk. Yeah. I got that special type of lean. So smooth, you think I'm cruising a low rider on Cinco de Mayo. See, I've been working on my walk for a while now, ever since I was a little chavalito. I could recall my father walking me through the process at an early age. He would say, walking is one of the simplest ways you can show someone your freedom. See, the first step to being enslaved is to actually get caught. Why you think Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez spent all that time marching? You gotta stay on your toes. The system has interesting ways of turning a man into a slave. If you ask my father for a ride, he would tell you to walk. After crossing the desert for a better life, he sees my walk to the University of Denver as an easy stroll to the park. Walking in my father's footsteps has taught me that if you love something, you will do anything you can to get to it. Your feet will get you there if you allow them to. My father walks with the determination of an immigrant, like his children will starve if he doesn't walk fast enough. Like there are immigration agents chasing after him. He is America's worst nightmare, a bad dude in a foreign country country and I always wanted to walk just like him but I always seemed to take the wrong steps walking in and out of jail pacing in my cell like a Kate's ocelot these must have been the ways to get enslaved my father talked about and it all started in the sixth grade when doctors explained to my parents why I walk with a slight limp my right leg was shorter than the left forcing me to apply most of my body weight on the right side I developed a walk that would quickly label me a thug I guess the inequality qualities I was exposed to finally drenched through my clothes and into my bones so now I walk like I got a wounded knee like the structure holds me down by my back pockets saggy jeans are one of the side effects left over from our oppression and when you walk with this much weight at an early age your steps begin to sound like ticking bombs the type of walk that make people move out the way the type of walk that make the cops want to follow you in 2012 Trayvon Martin was murdered for having the same walk as me. Yo, Trayvon was only 17, and they asked me why I cried, because he was just like me, because he walked just like me, still perfecting his own walk, still getting used to the feeling of walking in a black or brown man's shoes. This is the reason why kids like us never achieve social mobility. How can we climb the ladders of class if we can't even walk through our neighborhoods without feeling like someone is chasing after us? But I risk it all 
to show my son and the rest of the chavalitos in the world that we can walk to a better future instead of having to walk away from everything. So stand up and walk with me. We have the weight of the world at our feet. I think it's time that we exercise our freedom. And now for the city's newest music venue, Levitt Pavilion. Denver's newest music venue, the Levitt Pavilion, is located in the city's expansive 83-acre Ruby Hill Park, just minutes from downtown. It is the seventh Levitt performance venue in the United States. Ground was broken in November of last year, and the nine-month construction project began. The Levitt Pavilion at Ruby Hill Park is the result of the Levitt family's vision and dream. Their dream is that access to the arts and live music should not only be for those who can afford it, it should be for each and every person in the community. There should be no walls, there should be no barriers, and 50 shows each season would be free to the public. The citizens of this community, of these neighborhoods, stood up and said, we want more, we deserve more, and we're gonna get more. Opening night arrived in mid-July. It is about community. And the reason the Levitt is here is because the city, the private leadership, the foundations came together and said, this is what we want for our citizens of Denver. I am super excited I can even come walk in and not have to deal with traffic. Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah, looking forward to all the free concerts we can get. The venue received a major boost when Mayor Hancock recommended it to receive $2 million towards capital costs from the Better Denver Bond Program. The Greenway Foundation pledged support, and Friends of Levitt Pavilion Denver, the nonprofit that operates the venue, named Chris Zacker its founding executive director. You know, this is about providing opportunity from a cost standpoint, of, not from necessarily from the patron side, because that's free, but uh, of making certain that we're paying artists well and above scale. All of our shows have local openers, and then we have an eclectic mix of uh, national and international emerging artists um, that'll come through this stage. A lot of artists that people have heard of, or artists that people are just starting to hear about. You know, we look at it, we think of ourselves as tastemakers for the community, and we're here to introduce you to new music instead of the stuff that you're just used to listening to. We've spared no expense at this venue, so what you can expect to see is really quality production, quality music, quality acts, and a super family, friendly, fun environment. Well, without further ado, y'all have waited long enough. I'm so proud to present to you Slim Sessa's Auto Club. She met a man today by the look upon his face. The first season has gone well. The artist lineup even included Grammy nominees Gabby Moreno and Rocky Dawuni. A different music venue adds its name to the Denver music scene and it looks like it's here to stay. To be partners with a city that truly cares about the arts and puts a tremendous amount of money and resources back into it, it it's a blessing. Good night, Denver. We'll see you soon. If you want to learn more about this new music venue, check out levittdenver.org. And now, back to the Denver Film Festival. All right, so we're here at the C Film Center with filmmaker Davis Coombe. Davis, thanks so much for chatting with us. Sure, how it's are an you? honor to be here. So tell us a little bit about how you came to filmmaking. What was your sort of uh, trajectory to get to this point here? Well, uh, I, you know, I kind of found it in college. Uh, I went to school at uh, CU in Boulder, and they have a terrific film program up there. And uh, I was lucky at the end of it to get an internship at um, the Denver Center for Performing Arts. And they were making a lot of documentaries and, and kind of observational documentaries. And so I sort of accidentally stumbled across what ended up being a nearly 20 year career now. Wow, that's amazing. And you had the opportunity to work on some really awesome projects, award winning projects, Chasing Ice, um, Saving Face, uh, Lego Brickumentary. Tell us a little bit about how some of those projects came to be and what your role was. Well, my role uh, in filmmaking is, is mostly as an editor. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes a producer and, and writer. I did a lot of work with another Denver filmmaker uh, who has since moved to Los Angeles, Daniel Youngie, and he, he came up with the idea of, of saving face after hearing a, a radio 
story about uh, a woman in London who had been attacked with acid. Look at that. And Chasing Ice? Well, Chasing Ice is also uh, made by some Colorado filmmakers as well. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Orlowski, who's in, in Boulder, and Paula Dupree Pesman, um, a, a producer in Boulder. I met them at a screening of one of my other films here at the, at the, the Denver Film Society. And Jeff was really young then and walked up to me and said, hey, I want you to look at my film. And he ended up coming to my office the next week and showing me clips of Chasing Ice, some of the time-lapse photography that they had from that film. And it just blew me away. So mm -hmm. we got involved with that right away. Wow, wow. And now there's a, another Chasing film coming soon, right? Or in the works? That's right. We, we tried to think of another name, but it just was inevitable. Yeah. Um, Jeff, uh, in the, much in the same vein of, of following photographers trying to capture visual evidence of climate change, uh, spent years underwater all over the world uh, documenting the changes that are happening to coral reefs. He approached me at Sundance a few years ago and was like, I got another one. And so we, we got together again and, and uh, a few years later uh, finished Chasing Coral, which just came out on Netflix. Mm -hmm. For those not really familiar with the way the film process works, at what point does the editor get involved in the project? And you know, how do you see that through? Much of the writing uh, on documentaries comes together or happens literally in the editing room. Um, especially with observational films, uh, you don't really know what's gonna happen. So there's no way to script them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's usually comes down to the editor and the director identifying who the main characters are and deciding who to keep following. So, you know, in, in longer term projects, sometimes I have a lot to do with mm -hmm. what even gets filmed. Um, but mostly it, it's, it comes down to sorting through a mountain of footage mm -hmm. and finding a way to tell a story there when there was no plan to do yeah. so. Yeah. What do you think film's role is in our society uh, today? What, what can film do for, you know, us as, as, a, as human beings? Small question. Well, that's a <clears throat> that's pretty early in the day for yeah. that question. Yeah. You know, there there are kind of two two main purposes for film and for cinema, and one would be to reflect, uh, and the other to escape. Mm. So, uh, I, I think that uh, films should entertain, um, and in that way they should be comforting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they should also be honest and should reflect something about the world that we live in and, and the way that we treat each other yeah and um, that sometimes leads to the need to escape yeah, absolutely <laughs> and you're a, you're a local filmmaker but yeah. you've had widespread success um, what does it mean to you to be able to you know continue to live in in, in Colorado and, and be a, a filmmaker here and where is the film scene sort of heading uh, in the future here well I, I do feel lucky to to be here in Denver mm -hmm. making films. A lot of the people I went to school with left and fled to the coast mm -hmm. as soon as they started looking for work. But I, I love Denver and I love Colorado and I have no desire to leave. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely my favorite part of, of my work is sharing it mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, this is where we do it. Yeah. So there, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing elitist about the screening rooms here at, at DFS. Um, uh, it's it's not stuffy European subtitled black and white movies. <laughs> sure. You know, it's the the indie film scene is where it's at, and uh, you know it, the films are very accessible. Um, there's something here for everyone. Uh, it's really a great venue for local voices. Hey Davis, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. And now we're going to take a look at a clip from one of Davis's films. I'm on the phone with Jim on one of our regular check-ins. Like, Jim, nothing's happening. It's starting, Adam, I think. Adam, it's starting. Right. Look at that. Look at the whole thing. It all started in Iceland. I think I'm so certain to get wet, I'll take my boots off. I never imagined that you could see glaciers this big disappearing in such a short time. There's a powerful piece of history that's unfolding in these pictures, and I have to go back. 
The initial goal was to put out 25 cameras for three years, shoot every hour as long as it was daylight. That would show you how the landscape was changing. Oh, this is the way to travel, my friend. Putting really delicate electronics in the harshest conditions on the planet. It's not the nicest environment for technology. I do not want to go any lower than this. It's just bottomless. I'm going out here on this broken fin, and I assume it won't collapse. Every once in a while, you get the same. What were you thinking? <laughs> Maybe that office job wasn't so bad. This thing is loose. Rock, it's not working. God, all of that obsession means nothing if it doesn't work. Just be careful. Don't get too close to the edge, all right? This is terrifying. This knee has had two surgeries, and it really could use a third. We go to that point where he can't anymore, and sometimes he's going further. We have low operation engine number two. This is big stuff happening right now. OK, onward. This is the memory of the landscape. That landscape is gone. It may never be seen again in the history of civilization, and it's stored right here. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm Bobby Lefebvre. We'll see you next time as we discover more of Denver's art scene. In the meantime, I'm going to enjoy a private screening.